Okay, so we're back. And what I'm sharing with you today is a daylight map tracking um, application. And I really want you guys to play around with this um, so that you understand the concept of the circle illumination and also the um, maximum latitudes for the subsolar points and really what that looks like. So what we're seeing right now, now is we're seeing um, a depiction of the globe. We see the continents, um, northern and southern hemisphere. And we see this kind of parabolic shape, um, this mathematical parabolic wave um, that we're looking at, kind of very, very um, uh, kind of sin, sinusoidal looking. Um, and what we're seeing here is we're seeing the distributions of, of night and day um, on the map. Now, notice that there's uh, some areas, such as in the um, Southern Hemisphere, that looks like they're, they're receiving more daylight based on the, the width of, of the day area. And the Northern Hemisphere is as much smaller. It's not the same um, shape in comparison. Now, what we can do is we can go ahead and speed up the slider. So this is depicting what February 16th looks like for uh, distribution of, of daylight. So I'm going to go ahead and speed us a little bit forward on the calendar. And I want you just to kind of focus on the night and day um, and I'm going to go ahead and fast forward us to March 21st since that's the um, most recent um, celestial event for equal night and equal day. Now you should be seeing a changing in the shape. It's no longer parabolic but it's almost almost kind of equal. So okay we're getting close to March 21st. This is so cool. Okay so let's go ahead and stop that there. Okay now look at the subsolar point. The subsolar point is, is right here along the equator and it really does solidify the fact that um, both hemispheres are receiving equal night and equal day. So now let's go ahead and move this forward to um, June. So we're going to fast forward this in time. And what we should be seeing is that the lighter proportion of the shape should be greater in the northern hemisphere and less in the southern hemisphere. So June 21st. That's good enough. Okay. So, wow, pretty amazing. So the subsolar point now is at 23 and a half degrees north. And look at the higher latitudes. So anything above 66 and a half degrees north is going to receive over 24 hours of daylight, 24 hours of daylight. And then look at um, areas along the um, Antarctica, above the Antarctic Circle, um, that they're receiving 24 hours of darkness. Pretty darn amazing. Now let's go ahead and let's just move back to December. Let's look and see what December looked like for us. All right, so here we go. So boy, December, so that was around the shortest time of the year. Look at the subsolar point now, it is at 23 and a half degrees south. Um, and look at the Northern Hemisphere. We have a lot of darkness up at the higher latitudes. And look at the Southern Hemisphere, a lot of light um, in the Southern latitudes. So this is just a tool that I want you guys to play with. I'll go ahead and provide the link um, on our week five assignment overview. And I want you to play around with this. Show your roommate, show your partner, show your significant other, show your kids. Um, what a cool resource to look at where the subsolar point is at and how that influences um, day length and seasons um, on the Earth. Okay, so we're going to pick up here and start talking more about energy. We, I mentioned earlier that the sun's energy um, comes in the form of short waves. And so we'll spend some time talking about the electromagnetic spectrum. Now, your textbook touches on the fact that we have energy, two different types of energy. We have kinetic energy, which is, which is the energy due to motion. A rock falling from a cliff, a bee in flight, wind blowing leaves of trees, or water flowing over a waterfall are all examples of kinetic energy. Potential energy, on the other hand, is energy stored by an object that can be potentially transformed into another form of energy. So examples of this is going to be, you know, probably one of the most relevant examples for us locally is water being stored behind a dam, um, 
chemical energy of food as we consume it, and um, gasoline that we're putting into our cars. All these are great examples of potential energy. So some two photos that we see on the screen here, we see an avalanche that's taking place. So we have um, snow that's sliding down the mountain. Um, would this be an example of kinetic or potential? Well, hopefully you guys are all saying kinetic, that this is energy due to motion. So this would be an example of snow falling down a, a, you know, a mountainside. And then we have a hummingbird. Um, this is another great example, similar to the bee statement that I just made. A bee flapping its, its in, uh, insect wings in motion, a bird flapping its wings, a hummingbird. Um, this would be an example of our kinetic energy. Now let's take a local example. Um, this is an aerial photo of Mount Shasta. Is this going to be potential or kinetic? Well, what do we know about Mount Shasta? We know Mount Shasta is considered a, um, a dormant volcano. Um, and so even just thinking dormant, it's not active. But it, ha it is, has potential to become active, but it's just not too active at the moment. So this would be a great example of potential energy that we see here. Um, here's a, a picture of Shasta Dam. Another great example, um, considering what's happening at, uh, you know, down near Orville, the Orville Dam, um, we see that we have water being stored behind the dam with the idea that that water will be put into motion soon and generate um, electricity. So at the moment when there is no water flowing over the dam or the spillway or being released, it is potential energy. When I had put this slide deck together um, back a couple of years ago, I there was a great example that was taking place. This was a, a volcanic eruption that was happening in um, Japan. And there was a series of hikers that were actually ca uh, trapped um, hiking up the flanks of the mountain. And so you can see that the folks, the hikers, are covered in ash. Um, this was a, a great example of a dormant volcano that went from potential energy to kinetic energy very, very, very fast. Um, and you can see the volcanic eruptions taking place. And you can see the, the result of the volcanic activity. Um, there was some great photos of uh, volcanic bombs. So the, the lava, the, the magma that is exposed to the Earth's surface, turning into lava, then being projected into the atmosphere and turning into spherical pieces of hardened um, lava in the as we refer to as volcanic bombs and also ash so these are elements that um, were generated from the kinetic energy um, and now they are forces in motion and and we can now see them as rem remnants okay so as we start talking about energy we need to talk about how we start measuring energy and so for those of you that have taken a physical science class before maybe in high school um, the measuring energy equation is work equals force times distance. And we identify work as a force applied to some form of matter or object. And it's multiplied by the distance that, that this object is at. Um, and so when we look at how we measure work, um, the work or energy required to move an object with the force of one newton over a distance of one meter is called a joule. Okay, so this is looking at um, what is required in order to move something, how much force is needed, um, and how much, how much energy is used. And so we, we use terminologies to measure energy in the form of a calorie, which equals one amount, equals the amount of heat required to raise one gram of pure water from one degree Celsius. Now, calorie is a way that we measure um, energy. And, you know, these are the same calories that we're talking about in diets. You know, how many calories you burn, how much, how much you're working out. Um, you know, but the way that we measure a calorie is that we, we actually burn a substance and see if, how much heat is required to, to raise some water. Um, I used to work in a lab in Reno, and it was a health lab. And we did many different experience, experiments to determine how many calories were in certain different products. And so we were literally burning, you know, a banana. We were burning um, energy bars. And that same I concept of figuring out um, the amount of heat that's required to raise one gram of pure water from one, one degree Celsius allowed us to determine the calories that existed within those food items. 
And we also, here we are, we're coming back to watts. So remember that we identified watts as being a unit of measurement for the solar insulation. So we look, identify watts as being a metric unit of measurement of the intensity of radiation in watts over a square meter. So we'll talk about this um, as we start talking more about the solar insulation. Now, when we talk about um, heat transfer, we know that heat is energy of motion of molecules and atoms in a substance. And there's three ways for us to transfer this heat. The first one is through radiation, which we'll be talking about when we start identifying the electromagnetic spectrum. And that energy can be transferred in, in the forms of translation. We have conduction, where a substance is in contact with an with a item that's heating up and the molecules start to vibrate. And then we have convection, so we have the upward movement of warm air or liquid which we identify as a rotation. And so all three of these forms of heat we will be talking about throughout the semester, uh, radiation with electromagnetic, conduction, as, one, as certain things start to heat up um, geologically, looking at the Earth, um, and then convection when we start talking about weather and global circulation, so the upward movement of warm air or liquid. So that's really going to apply when we start talking about um, weather patterns um, and also ocean um, ocean patterns as well. So we can look at these three different forms of um, transfer of heat in the form of conduction. So the transfer of heat by collision of atoms or molecules. So we have one end of the pot handle starting to heat up and those molecules start to vibrate and collide and starts to heat up the remaining part of the handle. We also have convection, which is the transfer of heat by a move, movement of fluids. And we know we all experience cooking, um, boiling some water on the stove, and we know that we, the bubbles start to rise up from the middle and then start to rotate in circular downwards. So that's, that's an example of convection that we're seeing. And we also have radiation, so the transfer of heat by the electromagnetic radiation. Um, and these are going to be you know, hot, hot substances such as the sun, such as fire, um, such as infrared and visible ultraviolet parts of the spectrum um, are going to have very short waves. Um, they're very, very hot. And as a result, they, they appear on the, the shorter um, end of the electromagnetic spectrum. So here we are looking at the electromagnetic spectrum. We know that the sun's solar radiation enters the atmosphere as electromagnetic energy. And so this incoming solar radiation or insulation enters in, in different forms. All right, so 8% enters the Earth's atmosphere as ultraviolet, gamma, and X-rays. 45% enters the Earth's atmosphere as infrared. And 47 enter as visible light. Okay, these forms of solar radiation only occupy a portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. So let's go ahead and look at the electromagnetic spectrum. We see that it is measured in micrometers, um, as we see here on the right-hand side. Um, and going from short rays down to long waves, we identify um, the, different, the distance of these waves and size. So we can look at how waves are measured. They're typically measured from crest to crest or trough to trough. And the shorter distance that are between them um, we classify as short waves. Now, short waves are, are generally very harmful. So rays such as gamma rays, x-rays, ultraviolet, you know, this, this takes precaution. We need to wear um, lead panels and protection because these waves can harm us. Same, same type of, of energy that's coming from the sun. These are very harmful rays, and we are very appreciative of our atmosphere that's able to filter some of these waves, um, these very harmful waves that are being generated from the sun. Um, as we start going down into the visible light, we start to see um, our violets, blues, greens, yellow, orange, and red. And they are uh, described as being between uh, 0.40 and 0 0.70 uh, micrometers. So that's the, the wavelength of visible light. We then start going into thermal, infrared, microwave, and then our longest waves are going to be towards um, the bottom of our screen, where it's about one meter um, from crest height to crest height of the wave. And those are going to be our television, AM radio, and FM radio. 
Now let's go ahead and look at solar radiation as both a wavelength and frequency. And I'm going to go ahead and stop the lecture here and we'll pick up um,